Good morning, Paul, and thank you very much, firstly, for the introduction, um, but also for the privilege of being here this morning with your colleagues. It really is a pleasure and a great privilege um, to be amongst you all and speaking to a topic that I feel quite strongly about, and obviously a topic that has gained a lot of interest over the past period and specifically over the past years. In fact, it's because of the popularity of the topic that I did grapple quite a bit um, when putting together this, I'll call it a lecture, but I'll, or, or rather, in fact, a conversation starter. Um, I, I grappled because, you know, while the topic has been pertinent um, over the past period in light of the hashtag I can't breathe um, and hashtag Black Lives Matter uh, movements, um, of course, what's important is finding in an angle that is relevant, an angle that is fresh, and importantly, um, an angle to start or initiate this conversation, or let me not say initiate and make assumptions, but to continue hopefully a conversation that you've started um, in your own environments uh, in a way that is action orientated. Um, I mentioned these movements of I can't breathe and these hashtag Black Lives Matters because in this past year specifically, they've played a critical role in emboldening people to speak up on matters related to discrimination, um, prejudice, and it's a forced institutions um, like your own, um, establishments like <clears throat> the British Journal of Sports Medicine, in fact, to step up and have these uncom uncomfortable conversations, hopefully with the intention and the end point of actually initiating change. The other real challenge of course, is that um, in having this conversation uh, to a academic uh, audience, one often wants to reference many articles, but the reality is there are not many quality, uh, quantitative um, articles on systemic racism within sport and exercise medicine. Um, and what exists really is qualitative uh, articles and mostly actually editorials when it comes to our specific microcosm. Um, and so that in itself presents certain challenges. But since we're in the game of navigating and overcoming challenges, that has never deterred us. And I do have faith that the way in which I framed the conversation today will inspire conversation, will inspire thought, and hopefully will inspire action and change as well. So just as a um, first disclaimer, I, I do have no uh, conflict of interest, at least financial material to disclose uh, in this presentation. And of course, I won't be discussing any off-label use of drugs or products that's not relevant in this conversation. As I said, despite the various challenges uh, that there may be in framing a conversation like this in a way that is meaningful and relevant, um, I do hope that I will succeed in uh, achieving these objectives uh, for today's sessions, um, specifically that after the session you'd be able to understand and discuss factors that contribute to individual and systemic racism, that you would be able to reflect on your own personal and professional environments um, and understand whether or not there is bias and non-inclusive practice within these environments. And most importantly, I do hope that following this conversation starter, this lecture, um, you would be equipped to identify at least one action that you can initiate on your own to address either your own subconscious bias or to contribute to a more inclusive environment in your personal space or professional space. So by way of background, as Dr. Dykstra said, I am a sports and exercise medicine physician that is based in South Africa and practices from the east coast of South Africa in this red dot called Durban, in the city called Durban. Um, Durban is also known in South Africa as uh, South Africa's playground, very much because of its vibrance, its um, eclectic culture, and the beautiful scenery that just beckons to be explored. South Africa, of course, is notorious for institutionalized, institutionalized racial segregation um, that existed between 1948 and the early 1990s under what we all know as the apartheid regime. Now, we're notorious as a country, certainly not because we are the only country um, that has racist policy or discriminatory practices embedded into societal norms, but probably for a number of reasons, some of which <clears throat> that this discrimination was aimed at a majority demographic, which was abnormal in the context of racism at the time. Certainly because apartheid happened at a time where globally, in fact, um, and in other regions, previously colonized countries 
were rapidly achieving autonomy and independence. Um, and, and there was a, a visible transformation, of course, in leadership and political power to into the hands of the native residents. And lastly, apartheid, you know, achieved the notoriety, notoriety that it did, probably because of how brazen and bullish and violent um, the leadership was in protecting politically, socially, and economically uh, the domination of this minority population. So when it comes to institutionalized racism, of course, South Africa is a very clear and recent example of racism being overtly um, and obviously embedded into policy. And we're going to speak about that a little bit. Now, although apartheid ended officially in the 1990s, what we know, what we feel, what we see is that the economic and in fact social effects of the regime continue to this present day. And fundamentally, that's why we're having this conversation, because the role that racism, historical and present day, overt and subtle, the role that racism continues to play in protecting privilege in certain groups and enabling or perpetuating discrimination in other groups is still relevant. So it's often said that in order to know where you're going, you need to understand where we come from. Um, and, and to that effect, I thought, let's start this conversation very briefly with a history of on race um, and just outline essentially the origins of race as we understand it in modern day society. So race as we understand it today, it came about during sort of the historical process of exploration um, when Europeans essentially were exploring and discovering other continents and came into contact with different groups in these different continents. So as they encountered people um, and of different groups and that looked different, they speculated about the physical, the social and the cultural differences amongst these various human groups. And they developed a system to distinguish these groups. Um, and, and initially it really was just to distinguish. In fact, that's where Blumenbach's 1977, uh, these varietals of, of mankind emerged. And he just proposed five major race divisions, which is what you see on the right hand side. There was no hierarchy in, in this initial description, um, really. It was really just a description that, that, that described the physical attributes. This then, of course, later evolved to a system of ranking, which ranked people according to these attributes and specifically skin tone and perceived physical attributes, uh, creating a system of cultural superiority where whites were essentially considered the most evolved of the races, um, and the system justified subordination at that time, of course, of African slaves. So this social construct of race essentially is, is now acknowledged by most. But with this said, um, modern day scientists, they know, and we have known for very many decades, that there is little correlation between race, uh, as it's used in its popular sense, and actual physical variations in human species. So human race is not a real biological category. It's not a real biological category in the current um, taxonomic system that we understand, you know, of species, genus, family, order, class, phylum, um, kingdom, domain. These biological categories, these exist to help identify and understand diversity amongst living organisms. But modern day scientists actually attribute these human physical variations to evolutionary processes. So especially the traits that we normally use to classify people, so skin, uh, skin color rather, hair texture, um, facial features, these traits, all of them, um, there's evidence that they can be attributed to long-term adaptation of human groups to different environments or that they might simply uh, reflect uh, um, accidental mutation, genetic mutation. So importantly, race categories are not biological constructs, but they are social constructs. It's a social construct that classifies people according to arbitrary physical traits in order to justify discrimination of some groups and substantiate privilege in other groups which is really the crux of racism, which is defined 
as prejudice, um, discrimination, antagonism against a person on the basis of race or ethnicity. So that's, that's essentially landing us on the same page. Um, and I thought it was valuable to essentially just understand the history because it's important to understand, I guess, the arbitrary nature of, of this categorization of the system of categorization that is so embedded in our beliefs, that is so embedded in society, and that has informed and influenced so much of how we behave, um, of how policy is informed, um, and how institutions essentially, um, environments within institutions. So we've defined racism, um, and a really important point then is to just further define individual racism compared to, or as opposed to systemic, structural, institutional racism. And of course, with the con with the conversation um, around discrimination, racism, prejudice being so prevalent in the past year, these are terms that have been thrown around. These are terms that hopefully we are familiar with but terms that are worth, again, to ensure that we land on the same page and that as we progress in this conversation, um, we're starting off the same page and, 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 a, and a fair level of understanding are worth delving into, at least explaining furthermore. So individual racism really referring to um, the racist assumptions, beliefs, or behaviors of specific individuals. It's racism, it, 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 it's characterized essentially by, you know, racial slurs. Uh, it could be an example of it could be uh, jokes that take place. I think it's also important to acknowledge that, that individual racism is very much connected to socioeconomic histories, so this history which I've described, and processes. What's also important to acknowledge or understand is that individual racism can be conscious or unconscious. In other words, it can stem from conscious or unconscious bias. And so one can um, have racist assumptions that are subconscious or informed by subconscious bias. And an example is <clears throat> in the South African system, or even in fact in the global system, if you're sitting in your car and you see a black young man walking towards your car, you automatically close or lock your doors, right? You haven't thought about it. You haven't thought this black, this person is black and I don't like them and therefore they are racist, but it's a subconscious bias or an unconscious bias that informs or that, that feeling of um, I might not be safe and therefore let me do something to protect myself. That's just a random example. Systemic or structural institutional racism, on the other hand, um, really refers to the complex interaction between policies, uh, practices, um, and ideologies, essentially, that produce and perpetuate inequity. Um, inequity evidenced either by the exclusion of certain groups or the promotion of certain groups. Excuse my typing error over there. Again, I think what's really important to emphasize when we're speaking about structural institution racism is that this systemic racism or these mechanisms rather that operate in institutional or systemic mechanisms, racism, they are independent of individual racism. So in other words, even if individual racism isn't present, systemic, or institutional racism can persist because the environments and policies perpetuate inequity, essentially. And so some examples about this, again, apartheid was in South Africa is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a recent and a, a clear example of overt systemic institutional structural racism, where there was um, housing policies, where there were actually laws in place, obviously, that segregated um, communities and the population according to race and obviously disadvantaged some people. But there are other global examples like housing discrimination, um, as social segregation, racial profiling that takes place. Um, these are all these are all examples of systemic racism in our specific sector. Access to healthcare. Uh, I don't I don't need to say too much more about this, but we know this hiring and promotion practices, um, even the way that uh, some legislation and law is applied in terms of minimum sentences. How then, um, now that we've spoken really generally, I think let's let's zone in on the conversation. And I and I will tr obviously in this conversation, I think the the true beauty and the value that we'll get get in the conversation is, as I said, I would like to initiate or continue or, or ignite some discussion, but really like to also engage the panel and you in further discussion about how this is relevant in your own circumstances, 
Um, and more importantly, perhaps talk about things that we can do to acknowledge, address and overcome racism within our sector, a sector that we're all very passionate about. So let's then um, move from being general um, and speak very briefly about racism in, in sport and exercise medicine. Of course, racism in sport and exercise medicine exists as it does in every single industry. Um, we are not exempt. As much as we like to celebrate sport as a vehicle and a tool for inclusion, which it is and which it can be, we must acknowledge that even within the system that we both we all are so passionate about and, and, and that we admire so much for what it can potentially achieve, even within the system, um, we experience racism, we experience individual racism and, and, and of course, institutionalized racism. I mean, um, I could regale very many personal stories about how I have experienced um, racism within a sector. I was privileged to start my professional sports medicine career in rugby. I say it was a privilege really because of the extent of personal and professional growth that I experienced in this industry. But of course, if you know anything about rugby in South Africa, you'll also know that it is a predominantly white male Afrikaans sport in South Africa. And um, more so when I was beginning um, my professional sports medicine career 12, 13 years ago than it is now, although it still remains relative, um, dominantly white male and Afrikaans. Nonetheless, there was entering the environment as a black young female sports physician in probably the most Afrikaans union that there is in South Africa, um, or one of two, but probably the most Afrikaans and male dominated union that there is in South Africa. And of course, there were very many things that I had to navigate at the time. Um, there was the, the reality of, though the management system backed me, the players themselves didn't trust me specifically. And I, I genuinely uh, believe, and I see in retrospect, that it wasn't because of Pato that they didn't trust, but they didn't, understand, I guess, or trust what I represented in their own sphere. And so there are many examples, especially in the earlier days while I was at that particular union, where players would go to GPs to go and get a second opinion on a diagnosis that I had made as a sports physician. And of course, that diagnosis and even the way that they related, you know, um, that second opinion would be, yeah, 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 doc, yeah, um, may always, yes, doctor say it's right. You know, my house doctor is saying you're right. And, you know, you have to sit and you have to go, well, I mean, I knew that, but I'm glad that you now have the confidence to, to understand that. Um, there are many examples where it wasn't just about players. It was also colleague to colleague, you know, where, uh, especially when traveling with teams, I would hand over an injured athlete to a colleague of mine where I give a full clinical history. I indicate what I think the diagnosis is and suggest a management um, a management protocol. If we're traveling, of course, I have to hand over to another doctor to do the investigations and such. And when they return to us, they will then communicate their findings to the white male manager beside me, despite the fact that I was the one who handed over the patient and was quite clearly giving the clinical insights. But these are two of very many examples um, that I could regale. But, and, I, and I learned very early on that, um, firstly, one needs to pick their battles. But secondly, you need to be able to step into that space and stand and own that space. Um, and one needs to know how to assert themselves. Be that as it may, I think the point is, um, and I'm not the only person, of course, who can, who will be able to relate examples of, of racism, overt um, and subtle within sport and exercise medicine. Of course, in my case, and because of intersectionality of gender and at that time race, um, one could often not be sure whether this is just racism, whether this is sexism, whether this is ageism, whether it's a combination of all of it. But whatever it was, essentially one had to navigate it and there's very many examples of it. So if we come to um, sport and exercise medicine in, in uh, racism rather than sport and exercise medicine, um, Dr. Deisha alluded to an editorial that we wrote. And um, this is an editorial that we, we wrote again of the, in the wave of Black Lives Matter and I Can't Breathe. And we really felt, I guess, compelled to comment on what was happening, not just globally, but bring a microscope to sport and exercise medicine, because it's one thing for us all to be so vocal about what's happening out there, but we also need to realize that it's actually happening in here as well, in the space that we love, in the space that we protect. And the only way that we're gonna change things is by acknowledging them to start with. And so we wrote an editorial um, that shared some you know, personal experiences, um, but also importantly pointed out some areas in our professional space that need to be addressed, essentially, if we are to change the climate and the environment of sport and exercise medicine. 
Now, the first um, obvious comment that is made in this is that in this editorial is that clinicians of color do remain underrepresented. We see this anecdotally. Um, we see this if you just have to look at the professional teams and in the professional space. And importantly, as I said, um, ACM is reflective of what's happening in the larger global society. And so this underrepresentation of clinicians of color is reflective of underrepresentation of people of color as clinicians in general. The reality is there are no diversity statistics specific to SEM. So in this um, editorial, the best we could do and the best we can still do right now, and, and our next sort of paper is going to be about how do we start to measure diversity, inclusion, um, and equity within SEM. But the best we can do right now in, in, in at least making this point about a lack of representation is to look at the representation amongst the uh, doctor population as a start. And in the US, which is where my co-author is from, um, black doctors make up 8% of all doctors in a country where black people make up 13% of the demographic, all right? So the black population is one of the minority populations in the US, and this is reflected in the doctors, although it's still not represented or equal to the actual percentage of the demographic. But in South Africa, and this is again where you really see it, and this is still the effects of apartheid that are carrying through right now, um, these are statistics that were shared with us by the um, Health Professional Council of, Council of South Africa, because again, they are not published. But 31% of all doctors in our country are black in a population where 81% of the demographic is black. So that in itself, I mean, that's a, that's, that's a stark statement, you know, just in looking at those stats. But again, I, I think um, what's, what's, what's really needs to be emphasized is that even within sport and exercise medicine, if you look now beyond uh, doctors specifically, because we're speaking about clinicians in general, um, people of color are still historically in these physically laborious roles. They are, historic, they are in these junior slash mid-level roles. Um, and again, there's limited opportunity for growth and advancement into leadership roles. If you just look at the number of clinicians, researchers at junior levels compared to senior level. So while you might see more diversity at a junior level when I speak to clinicians, so look at the physical therapists, you can look at chiropractors, you can look at doctors, they may be better, not appropriate, but better representation and diversity at junior level but that does not translate into leadership uh, positions and advancement at a senior level. Um, Tracy Blake published this paper in the British Journal of Sports Medicine last year as well. And in her paper, she identifies and makes a statement essentially that inequity in research and academic publishing is rife and is a problem. Um, Tracy Blake points out that Essentially, the research agenda and the academic space is dominated by older white cisgender males. And this very much influences the research agenda. Um, while there has been an advancement, and we have to acknowledge the advancements that has been made in terms of gender diversity in the research and academic space, this has not yet been seen or has not been reflected in a similar advancement in terms of racial and ethnic diversity in these spaces. She makes um, a number of other really important points um, around, for instance, the fact that within research, we speak very often about the biopsychosocial model. It's a prominent conversation piece, yet we seldom speak about the social determinants of health or the impact that oppression has on the research process. She speaks about research being flawed and inequity existing within research, because while we hold researchers accountable for many things, including ethic, ethics practice, as an example, and ethical approval, we don't hold researchers accountable for culturally competent research practice. In terms of our, our methodology, as an example, um, and discussing our research findings, and you know, often there's a section, or importantly, there's a section when you publish in research where you have to discuss your limitations, but very seldom is there discussion about how the disparity between demographics in a, in a study population, and in other words, oftentimes the lack of diversity in your study population could impact generalizability of those findings. And this is fundamental, of course. And so 
I mean, I've just really like put taken a uh, like a cherry on the top and really just sliced the top and there's a mountain to uncover beneath this. But again, in the interest of time and discussion, I want to initiate a certain um, line of conversation and encourage conversation and discussion thereafter. But if these are the problems that we see within the SEM clinical research and academic space, where to do we go from here, you know? And, and in mentioning again the, the academic and research space, I think what's also important to, to just note, and again, the important thing here is there are no diversity statistics. So in gathering this information or making these statements, um, we are making, we, we are using anecdotal evidence. Um, you look at research interest groups, you look at these thought leadership groups, um, you look at consensus statements, and consider the diversity there again, as I, as I acknowledge, and I'll be first to acknowledge the advancements that we've made in terms of gender diversity and including more females within these groups is clear. There has been progress, not, perhaps not enough, but there certainly has been progress. But have a look just within your own spaces, look at your leadership structure, look at the research groups, look at the academic groups, look at the thought leadership groups and consider the diversity within these groups when it comes to race and ethnicity. So way too from here. Well, the first thing to say, if it's not quite clear, is that representation is important, right? Um, there's a business case for diversity and inclusion, not just within sport and exercise medicine, but in multiple industry. And in multiple industries, diversity and inclusion, and I mentioned this separately because it's one thing to be diverse and have, have representation, but it's quite another thing to um, foster an inclusive environment that, as an example, uh, enables the people of color to speak up enables growth and promotion and leadership um, of people of diverse ethnic groups. So diversity and, and inclusion is associated across multiple industries with the attraction and retention of talent, with improved customer insights, and generally with improved organizational growth and business performance. Within the SME space specifically, um, we as an I put forward that diversity within SEM will also and similarly improve outputs within sport and exercise medicine. Diversity and inclusion within SEM would broaden the inputs and the perspective when we are drafting clinical protocols. So in other words, if you had more diverse research groups, you would have more diverse perspectives when you're drafting protocol. A diverse clinical groups and research groups would lead to the better understanding of the backgrounds, needs, and motivations of athletes. In this way, diversity within SEM would lead to more inclusive research, and ultimately, more inclusive research, more inclusive clinical practice would improve would would lead to improved patient care. So what's the toolkit? What's the practical step if we if we acknowledge and we say we acknowledge that representation is important, that diversity import is important, and that inclusion is important? Well, we really like toolkits in sport and exercise medicine. There's a toolkit for pretty much everything. And if we were to apply the same principle, well, firstly, one has to say that you'd need a number of tools because this is not a, a simple um, uh, challenge that we're trying to navigate. Um, and so you'd need a number of, of tools that would be applied in a number of different ways in a number of different contexts. But if I were to broadly categorize and really just, um, again, focus our conversation as I had, firstly, you'd need tools that would enable you to acknowledge and address your own individual bias. And specifically here, I'm talking about racism and racial bias or ethnic, ethnic bias. And then you'd need specific tools that would enable you to address and acknowledge and overcome systemic racism, and specifically to change policy practices and change non-inclusive environments. I won't be able to, I can't claim that I can give you the entire toolkit now, because I think it's a work in process. And if we had every single tool and we, need, and we knew the answers to all of this, I would like to think that we wouldn't be having this conversation or we'd be having this conversation in a very different way. But of course, um, there's always a place to start and there's always ideas to share. And that's that's what I'd like to do in hitting this home stretch. And so what's in the toolkits um, and what are the tools? So the first one is to acknowledge your own bias. Um, acknowledge your own bias 
would be an important starting point. Um, you can't change what you don't know, as they say. Um, and increasing one way, I guess, to increase your, 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 your awareness is to expose yourself to people who are different to you. Because again, if you're surrounding yourself with people who are thinking the same as you, you may never know that there's a problem in the way that you are thinking. So a small thing that you can do to understand your own bias is to surround yourself with people who are from diverse backgrounds and who are different to you. These eight steps, um, before I actually continue, um, again, were published in a paper uh, in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, um, led by Katie Marino, a paper entitled Embrace Your Discomfort, and spoke about understanding um, uh, unconscious bias and leadership with an SEM. But so, and, 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 and in this editorial, they outline, we outlined um, these eight steps, the first being acknowledging your own bias. The next step really is about how do you change the workplace? Um, and an important thing here, changing the workplace is about changing or making sure that the workplace fundamentally is more diverse. And so if you are in leadership positions, you should be recruiting for diversity, recruiting for diversity, not just so that your stats look better, but because of the very real outcomes that we know take place from a business success perspective. And again, the very real and tangible and meaningful outcomes that I've just touched on in terms of how this might translate to better research and better practice. So as a starting point, you should actively be rec recruiting for diversity, racial diversity, gender diversity, diversity in every way that you understand it. So this will just make for better insights, perspectives, and better processes and better outcomes. Change in the workplace also involves changing non-inclusive policy. Um, policy that relates to remuneration, policy um, uh, that relates to small little things, and I'll use a school example, but small little things like recently in South Africa, um, there was a huge protest about discriminatory practice related to hairstyles, acceptable dress and practice at work that could be um, overtly discriminatory. Then the third uh, tool that I'd like to suggest is changing the culture. Changing culture, um, similar to changing workplace, requires a proactiveness. It's about gently calling people out when you notice uh, unconscious bias or examples of overt racism. And it doesn't need to be aggressive. Um, you can frame this as an opportunity for discussion, frame this as an opportunity to reflect, frame this as an opportunity to grow rather than a frank insult. But it does require you to call it out when you see it, otherwise it just is perpetuated. Um, changing the culture also involves actively creating an environment in which all colleagues can openly speak about issues related to racism and discrimination. One of the tools we discuss is empowering diverse voices. Um, and while this sounds very obvious, um, it isn't. Because obvious, oftentimes when we speak about racism, you know, you'll speak on behalf of people. When you speak about issues, you'll speak on behalf of people. But it's really important to listen to the people who you are trying to understand, to, to who you're trying to hear. Um, and it's important to ensure that everybody feels that they have a voice at the table, but not just that they have a voice at the table, that they are actually being heard. Um, not that just they're just there for the sake of, you know, representation, but not because they're actually going you know, that, that their opinion is going to be included. Really important also to um, celebrate progress. And so one has to acknowledge that this is not an easy process. It's an uncomfortable process, but it's a necessary process. And so we need to just celebrate the small milestones. We need to recognize, acknowledge um, small changes in attitude, changes in culture, um, changes in behavior, because this will reinforce those positive changes. Um, many of you will have heard, of course, um, of the importance of being an ally. Um, and there are very many ways to do this. You can be an ally be, by being a mentor. You can be an ally even better by being a sponsor. You can be an ally by ensuring um, that you create space uh, for these conversations to be had, for inclusion to take place. Um, and this becomes really, really important. Create space within your own research groups. Um, create space within your own academic circles. Create space even within your own social circles. That very much leads to the next point of practicing inclusivity and how you need to be intentional about inclusivity. Um, you need to ask for opinions. You need to consider the opinions that are given to you. Um, you need to ensure that there is appropriate representation before you initiate a conversation and not just the conversation around equity, diversity and inclusion, right? That's not the only thing that people of color can speak to, of course, 
Um, I'm speaking here about general academics and of course all research, and we've spoken about the importance of diversity here. And then lastly, one needs to lead by example. You need to lead by example in terms of how you step up to these conversations, in terms of how you respond to people um, who give you feedback about this, and of course, about how you implement any of these, any of these tools um, that, that I, I have um, tabled, I guess, for, for discussion and for consideration. Um, we are all familiar with, as, as SEM professionals, um, as I hit the home stretch, we're all familiar with uh, the framework for um, translation of research uh, to injury prevention. And Tracy Blake in her paper um, argues that we should be as robust and critical and method methodological in our approach to overcoming and addressing racism as we are to injury prevention. And of course, we know that in terms of those fundamental steps that have now that have now evolved, but it is about evaluating the extent of the problem, understanding those factors that contribute to the etiology and that that increase risk of the problem and enable risk. It's about outlining an intervention, an intervention that is context specific. It's about implementing that intervention in a way that is context specific. And then it is about measuring the effects of the intervention and those processes. And only if we are the, that robust in our approach to overcoming racism within SEM will we stand a chance, of course, of reforming the system. And so with that, I would like to invite um, you into a conversation and, of course, um, welcome the views of my fellow panelists. Thank you, Paul. Yes.